that security is at the beginning and at the end of almost every single job. If we don't feel in security, there is no way we can operate, we can be efficient in what we are today. Now, what is
بشكل اكبر خاصه المرحله اللي بعدها ساعات ساعات بالاستقرار السياسي شكرا Thank you very much. <coughs> so education leading to unemployment, illiteracy, and brain drain. Yeah, okay. it's almost just the same thing. Yeah, just the same. About women. No problem. Okay. My friend from Yemen. Yeah. <laughs> أدركت وأيقنت أن هذه من قادة العالم لا لا تدري الحياة الإنسان لا تسمعت الإنسان أبسط أصبح حكي أن يحكي الإنسان أن يكون يكتسب أو يكون ما يمتلك هو صحة وتعليم هذا الشيء لا يوجد في يمن لا يوجد أم لا يستقر وضع المرأة في يمن لا نتحدث عنه لا يوجد تعامل الإنسان كإنسان Women's situation. It's, all, it's once again the community. We have been discussing all these community level concerns. Education is a community problem. We need to educate our people for them to take better care of themselves. So better, or the higher you educate, the more likely you can take care of yourself. Now, education is not only about studying French or English or Italian or whatever. It's about studying things your society considers as being the things you need to study to be a very useful citizen of your society. So let's not make this mistake thinking that education is on the Western norm. You can be highly educated without speaking Spanish, without speaking French, without speaking German, and speaking only Wolof, my mother tongue. So, we also talked about the women concerns. Women, sometimes, gender-based discrimination. We do things against women just because they are women. And they are our mothers, they are our wives, but still, our societies have not taken best care of our women. This has to change. We cannot continue like that. Okay? And we cannot also continue to not just, based on the fact that you are a woman, you are not going to school. So the percentage of illiteracy we are talking about is a lot higher in the women community than in the men community. So those are community problems we need to fix. Go ahead. Mon frère. Comment ça va? Ça va? Le Tunisien. La sécurité communauté. Arabe et anglais. Arabe et anglais. Ok, français. La sécurité communauté. Je pense que ça marche ici, non? Oui. Je vous pose une question. Oui. La sécurité communauté, c'est quoi en anglais? Security and community. Yeah. Uh, Security and community. <laughs> no, they can. The Tunisians, they have a good uh, approach. Uh, yeah. Security. Thank you. بيهاجموا الأديان الأخرى الموجودة في تونس الأقليات مثل يهود تونس والأقلية المسيحية وكمان بيهاجموا الفنانين والموسيقيين والممثلين لذلك نحن في تونس نعاني من هذه السيكوريتي Yeah, I think we covered, we, yeah, uh, we're just reiterating things we have covered already, and you're right. So, it's a community security, I talked about it. You know, even worse, I don't have time to uh, really dwell on all the things I would like to touch on, but in Eastern Africa, in Tanzania, for example, 
the albinos community. Albinos mm -hmm. community. Sorry. Albinos. 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 Albinos community. <coughs> they are killed during the elections. Because all the ministers in this country who don't want to be removed from the government, they think that if they have the albinos arm or the albinos ear or the albinos leg, their tradition and beliefs will make that he will not be removed. So they pay people to go and chase albinos. They killed and cut into small pieces and sold just because they are albinos. So, you know, the community insecurity is a big problem. Because you are selfish and you can be, you can believe in whatever you want. But you also have the responsibility to let the others believe in whatever they want. It's the only way we can make it in our world. If you want everybody to have the same belief as you, to look like you, to wear clothes like you, no, we will never make it. God has not created us equal and similar. We have differences and we need to respect these differences. So, very good point. My friend, you want to take the floor? Oh, you, you're okay? You already made your point? Okay, no problem. My brother, no problem. تقريبا كل الشريات وقع التعامل معها في مجال التعامل مع الدول. زميلي من تونس تحدث عن خطر سلفي هو مربوط بالتعصب الديني. عن خطر يتمثل في التعصب الديني. يعني ولا في التطرف من أي طرف كان. احنا في تونس التطرف موجود التطرف الديني هذا نوع من عن نوع من المشاكل اللي هي تهريب الأسلحة من من الجيران تقريبا من من ليبيا تمر الأسلحة للجزائر وتعبر تونس أنا هذا خطر نوعا ما أمني على مستوى دولة بس يقع التعاطي معه على مستوى الجيش والقوات الأمنية وفيه مشاكل أخرى زي ما قال الطالب والتعليم إحنا عنا المشاكل الاقتصادية يعني عنا مشكل أمني كبير هو الهجرة الهجرة غير الشرعية يعني تقوم كوارث كبيرة هجرة هجرة غير شرعية مواطنين تونس وأفارقة يغادروا من السواحل التونسية لإيطاليا جزيرة لامبدوزا المتخصصة لقربها يعني مسافة أقل من 130 كيلومتر يمكن يعملوها يعني بمراكب لا تتوفر فيها شروط السلام وشروط الأمان وتقوم كوارث إحنا منذ تقريبا منذ مدة أسبوعين كيف غرق مركب معناها يقوم بالعبور غير الشرعي هذا غير مجهز وفي أكثر من سبعين مخطوط يعني مركب يتسع لعشرين راكب راكبين في مية وأربعين شخص يعني نصفهم نصفهم مفقود في البحر لين أكثر من أسبوعين هذا يخلق معنى نوع من معنى مشاكل مرتبطة بالاقتصاد بعد توفر الأمن يعني اللي مربوط بالبطالة وبالتعليم وبالتفاوت بين الجهات في التنمية على السواحل وفي الجهات الداخلية في نقص في منوال التنمية في منوال التنمية غير عادل ويخلق نوع من الفرستريشن بالنسبة للشباب وهذا اللي يخلي نوع من الأحباط اللي يخلي جو مشهور
Thank you very much for for reiterating this, uh, my friend. Okay, you know, well, uh, another uh, Anyone? I
economic security is a big concern. Now say bad not. We all talked about it. Nowadays we cannot ignore the importance of the environment. Everything is environment. Countries that have cost are threatened of losing most of their coastal villages just because of the rise of the level of the sea. The coastal erosion is creating a lot of problems in our country. Many, many, many fishermen villages have disappeared because of the coastal erosion. We cannot. Our forests are being devastated. Many of the animals, many of the natural species are disappearing because of the way we are aggressive on a daily basis, our forests. And if we don't have the forest, we don't have enough trees to take the CO2. So it will come backfire on our health and we don't have enough oxygen. So all these things are interconnected and we need to make sure that we take care of it. Environment nowadays cannot be important. We talked about the pollution of the water. The water is polluted, you go, you drink it, you get sick. There is no hospital to go, or if you go to the hospital, you don't have money to buy the medicine. You see, you're in a vicious circle, extremely difficult to get out of. So the environment and security is also important. Now, we talked about religion. Yes, religion. Nowadays is sometimes a source of difficulty. Some people think that everybody should be a Christian. Some others think that everybody should be a Muslim. Yeah. It's a problem. So the communities are also clashing. Just sometimes black and white. If you go to the US, the black community, the Hispanic community, they have some difficulties with American America. Just because they're black or they're Hispanic, they have problems. So it happens everywhere. Now, we need to work on our tolerance to understand that there is only one world. There are no two worlds. It's only one. We cannot leave it. We have to stay. So the only way we can stay here is to be tolerant, to accept each other, to accept our differences. So the community security is also the concern. Now we have talked about health. Yes, <laughs> health is a problem sometimes. Most of our people cannot access to healthy, to, 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 to decent health infrastructures because of lack of means. Sometimes it takes you one hour to get from your house to the closest air health infrastructure. You can lose your life. Sometimes you even don't have an ambulance that can come and take you. Or if you call the ambulance, they will tell you we don't have gas to come and take you. These are the basic things we are living on a daily basis. So the health security is a problem. Food. As I say, we don't have enough food. Most of our families nowadays eat one time a day. Everybody goes out and struggles as he can or as she can to find what to eat. And before it wasn't like that. Before we were eating, we were eating enough. Morning, lunch and dinner. But now, <coughs> if it is easy for people like us, it's very difficult for most of our countrymen. You see people starving, they have nothing to eat, and they are vulnerable. So the food security is also a problem. I wanted to list all these seven security issues for you to understand that these are the seven pillars of what we call nowadays the human security. These are the seven pillars of what we call nowadays. Wherever you go and people tell you about human security, these are the seven pillars. Yes. Sorry. We didn't 
But did they talk about education? Where it, fits? it fits in community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sexual diversity, for example, the same. It's a community. Community is the largest part. Of it. Yeah, you have a lot of things in the community. Okay. So these are the seven pillars of the human security. Uh, food security is the, the in the end of the. Uh, it's not uh, by priority. Okay. It's not by priority. Depending on where you are, okay. the priority will change. In some places. It's environmental issues. In some others, it's going to be community. In some others, it's going to be food. But these pillars are the seven pillars we consider as being really the main ones of the human security issues we are facing nowadays. Now, once we have said that, the problematic we are facing now is to try to respond to this question that comes very often again and again to ask if the organizations, the structures that have been traditionally in charge of security issues, are they still relevant to take care of this security? This is the main problematic we are facing nowadays. Our security concerns have changed. Can we afford to keep the structures that have been in charge until now of the security issues be exclusively in charge of this security? My answer, and I'm sure your answer is no. We cannot afford to continue to think that our traditional security <laughs> structures, organizations, <laughs> can continue to be handling the security issues. What can the police do in environmental issues? Maybe something, but they cannot be exclusively in charge of this. Can the military do on political security? Yes. They have a role to play, but I'm sure we cannot count on them exclusively to solve the political security issues. What can the gendarmerie or the police do on food security? They cannot deliver food to everybody. Yes, for sure they have a role to play, but we cannot count on them. This is the situation in which we are. In the 21st century, we are facing these issues. Our people are directly threatened by these issues. Now, how can we have our security <laughs> apparatus to evolve and tackle efficiently these issues? That's what we need to ask ourselves. How can we evolve and take care of these issues? Is it clear? No. Or I need to cover it again? It's clear. It's crystal clear. It's clear. <laughs> crystal clear. Our security for our friends who just joined us, our security concerns have evolved. Now the question we are asking ourselves is, can we continue to treat security the way we have been treating it. We all say that it's no. Now, what can we do? First, we can try to have our traditional security structure evolve. And it's, it's, it's clearly one of the things that need to happen. Our military people <laughs> cannot continue to think the way they have been thinking until now. If they really care for our security, they cannot continue only to think that it's by deploying their tanks, it's by deploying their missiles, it's by buying fighter jets, it's by buying uh, Navy warships that they will take care of our security. Yes, 
is far away. Because, once again, let's not be naive to think that we have escaped from this traditional insecurity we have been facing until now. We can always have one crazy neighbor that can decide to come and invade our country. So I'm not saying we need to get rid of our military, no. Because wars have the specificity to be unpredictable. They can happen anytime. So you need to be prepared for that. But why you are not fighting a war? And your citizens are suffering from all these things. What can you do? Hybrid security service. Ready to protect the country when it is necessary. But why we are not fighting to protect our country? And our populations are suffering from, from this. What can we do? So the solution is yes, to try to have the kind of hybrid security sector, a hybrid security organization that is professional enough to go to war when it is necessary, but flexible enough to be contributing to tackling these issues our people are dying of. Those are the changes we need to have happen. I want to give an example of a small country called the Kingdom of Bhutan, which is in the Himalayas, where they measure the happiness quotient of the citizens. Uh, yes. So yes. Uh, it's very important. It's a, it's, it's a poor country because it is, a, 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 what should I say, a mountainous terrain because it's in the Himalayas. It's a small uh, kingdom. But where, uh, you know, the, there is some form similar to Jordan, the, uh, you know, the, there is a parliament, there is some form of democracy and the king, but they measure the happiness quotient of the citizens. And they try to tell the citizens that you are important. You mentioned about citizen sentiment. So it is not what security you have, the feeling that people have that they are secure. It is not physical security, it is not food security. Like I, I wanted to mention, like uh, I'm from India, you can put all those problems multiplied by 100 or 1000, that is our problem. Yes. Like if you told about Morocco, for 60 million, ours is uh, 1.2 billion. So you can imagine what the problem is. You can multiply how many factors. So, and uh, it is not that we don't have the resources, okay? We have all the resources in the country, but they are absolutely mismanaged. They are abused, okay? We have food grains and they are rotting in warehouses and people are starving. Yes. Why? Because the food grains are not taken and delivered there. Why they are not taken and delivered there? Because if it is delivered, people will be happy. They don't want them to be happy. So that they can say that we are trying to give them food subsidy and then <coughs> people will take that subsidy and take it and stash it in Swiss banks or not. It's a big vicious circle. Okay. So the corruption. The level, how it is. So yeah, ultimately, it all boils down to the culture of the country and how transparent it is to the public. And that is where the biggest democracy in the world has been. So it's a warning to all other countries which are now pitching for democracy to make sure that it's not going to be a failure from day one. You have to make it a success from day one. Otherwise, what you are fighting for will be a lost battle, like what Gandhi said. Gandhi, within five months of independence, he died, he was shot dead, and he said, this is not the India which I wanted. Yeah. It is a lot more complex. It's even a lot more volatile. Our <coughs> society's conditions change from hour to hour. What matters for us now will not matter for us the next day. We are in a very dynamic world. Things are changing very, very, very quickly. So we need to acknowledge this. Time is crucial nowadays. What was relevant two years ago will not be relevant in one month's time. So how we can put ourselves in a situation that helps us always catch up, adapt, effort, to be in line with the situation be it 
in the economic side, in the political side, or in just the health or humanitarian side in general. So, how can we do that? My friend talked about Bhutan just valuing happiness. I think this process of thinking of what matters for you is extremely important. The privatization. What matters for us in Senegal is rice. If the Senegalese do not have rice, we're all unhappy. Rice. Because we eat rice all the time. Now, you go to Tunis, where they fought very hard, the government, because of the rise of the bread prices. Maybe bread for Tunisians matters. Now, all societies need to take time and prioritize. What does matter for my society? Bhutan did it, say happiness. So, I will say what really misses in most of our countries. And we are working on a project to assist our brothers in Libya to work on this document, is the establishment of what we call a national security strategy or a national security policy. My friends, nothing can be practiced very well, efficiently, if it is not conceptualized in a coherent way. If you don't take time to do the theory, you will not be successful in the practice. So we need to acknowledge that our environment has changed. Our concerns have evolved. We don't have all the resources to tackle all of that at the same time. We need to prioritize. And this process of prioritizing, we call it the definition of a national security strategy or national security policy. How you call it does not matter. The substance of the document really matters. But there is a process that will never vary. When you want to define this framework that organizes the way you are tackling your security challenges, you need first to assess very thoroughly the environment in all aspects. All aspects. You need to assess where I am in terms of health, where I am in terms of education, where I am in terms of respecting your women's rights, where I am in terms of delivering health to my people. You assess and you know where you are. And you say, now that I know where I am, I think that the main priority for me is to tackle this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. So the second element in all of our countries, wherever you are, please is to prioritize your security threats. Security is not about tanks anymore. It's about those issues. It's about education. It's not about tanks. It's not about fighting war. It's about just surviving. What matters? Happiness will give us the strength to do everything because we are happy. It's their choice. You also need to choose in your country. What matters for you? There is no way that you can cut and paste. It's a homegrown process. It's for you based on your culture, based on your history, based on the values you care for, based on your norms, your religion, to say this is what matters for me and take responsibility to address this issue. So the second thing is really to set your priorities. Sure, uh, the security is better than another country. 
but inside the mechanical, the force says that the security is the first uh, issue to the citizens. Then I think that uh, it's very important to, after all of that, what happened with the perception of the citizens about our own um, reality. I totally agree with you. You cannot do this process ignoring how your people work on this. It needs to be a participatory way of setting the priorities. You're talking about the security. Security is not now one word that means the same everywhere. It's important for you to bear this in mind. Security will depend on where you are on which period of time you are. What is your insecurity today will not be your insecurity tomorrow. What will be your insecurity in Chile will not be the insecurity in France. So that's why I told you that you need to take time to assess your situation. Assessing the situation is going, meeting your people, your people asking them, what do, you, what do they care for? What do they value? It's organizing caravans, campaigns to get all the information. And in a participatory way, say, this is our country's situation. You're not making it up. It's based on facts, based on workshops, based on discussions. Once you have done it, now therefore, you need to push forward and start prioritizing. Say, these are my security concerns. And you need to do it on a regular basis because the situation you have access today is not the situation you will live in tomorrow. So you need to put in place structures that are following the evolution of the environment and that will advise you in the adaptations you need to undertake. Okay, you wanna, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what happened uh, to the uh, Hold on, Michael. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, this one? Go ahead. So if you don't know what really matters for you, 
you will not be efficient. In your house every day, you prioritize. You wake up in the morning, you have five dollars. But you need bread, you need your kid to go to school and need maybe to take uh, something with him. Uh, your wife is asking you also to give her something to buy vegetables, to prepare the, the, the lunch. But you have only five dollars. And all of us, we will prioritize how we will spend the five dollars. The state, they function the same way. That's the same. We have a budget, limited, and we have a lot of problems. We don't know how to start. So we need to prioritize. This is the national security strategy. What matters for us is really listed. And now we will say how we are going to now spend what we have in our pocket as a country to tackle what really matters for us. That's uh, as simple as this. If you don't do it, you don't know where you want to go. And if you don't know where you want to go, all roads take you where you want to go. Because you don't know. You know, now you know what are your objectives, what you want to achieve. You take now your resources and you try to achieve those goals. This is the national security strategy. So we talked about human security. We talked about the definition of a national security policy or national security strategy, which is the process. And please remember that your national security strategy of today, or of 2012, is not relevant anymore in 2014, because the environment will change. So if you have the best national security strategy in your table, and you say, I'm done, that's okay, I have the Quran or the Bible, I can solve all my problems, you're wrong. Because the situation will evolve. So you need, while you have this document somewhere, put in place small organizations which work is to only assess the situation. And we'll tell you, sir, what we planned two years ago is not relevant anymore because this has changed, this has changed. And you don't wait until it is too late. You will adapt your national security. Yes. And the end is there. Mm -hmm. And the end of the end is there. Yes. And the end of the end is there. Yes. And the end of the end is there. Yes. And the end of the end is there.
governance experts, political experts, all of them have said that there is no way anymore that government alone will be tackling this issue. It's impossible. There is no way anymore that government alone will be tackling this issue. Why? Because government are overwhelmed. We expect everything from our government. They cannot. The security problems are so many, they're so complex, they're so ambiguous, that if we all sit in our houses and say, our government has to tackle these issues, we'll never solve this. Based by facts, our government cannot. It's impossible. The, the, the government, because of the magnitude of the problem, cannot. That's one. Second, the form of these problems, the forms of these problems, require that all citizens, wherever they are, with whatever capacity and expertise they have, to bring these capacities and these expertise to the table for the country to be able to tackle this issue. You brought uh, the, 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 the key problem. We, were, we took time to talk about all these issues, to have you understand the magnitude of the problem, to have you understand the ambiguity of this problem, to go to this conclusion that Nowadays, guys, we cannot continue crossing our arms and say we expect from the government to deliver our security. They will not deliver because it's too much. We're asking the government to do too much. They cannot. They don't have the means. They don't have time. They don't have the resources. You ask, yes, you criticize, it's for you. But if they don't do it, your problem is not solved. So more and more strategies, <coughs> more and more security strategies, security experts are saying, isn't it time for all available energies, all our, all the children, be they girl, woman, of our countries to understand that it is time for them to bring their contribution to solving this problem. That's, that's, that's what, is, what it is about. <coughs> the citizen, the citizen, the average citizen being at the heart of finding solutions to this problem. What can the government do <coughs> If one citizen, instead of respecting the traffic lights that are in red and go kill another one, yes, the government will take sanctions later, but the person is killed already. It's about personal security. We have responsibility in this. What can the government do if we, every day, take our waste, go to the river, and throw our waste there, and pollute our river, or pollute our water, to the extent that people will not be able to access to potable water. These are the things. What can our government do if people are just not cleaning their houses, to live in healthy conditions that will not set the ground for the proliferation of like tuberculosis or yellow fever. Yes, the government can sensitize, the government can educate, but the government cannot do everything. Each one of us has responsibility. This is what it's all about now. Each one of us has responsibility. 
to take on these issues? Yeah. My brother, and I come to you. Right? See, uh, uh, your, your point is very valid. But uh, what we should notice that in an evolved society, it is the people who hold the government. <coughs> like an example that I gave, that in UK, every policeman is a citizen in uniform, and every citizen is a policeman out of uniform. That means the citizen should say that I have all the responsibility of a policeman to monitor my entire community. The minute you surrender your rights to the policeman, you become subordinated to him. And that is what is precisely happening today in most of the democracies. They leave it to something called government. Actually, there is no definition of government. They are the people who we have elected. They are the people who are appointed as officials to run the various ministries and departments. And they are not the real stakeholders because they have all the power within them to make things done for themselves. Like if you analyze, less than 2% of the people are called government and the rest of the 98% are the citizens. So it is a 2% which controls the 98%. And if you allow them to control, you can imagine what will be your fate. Because they are not the stakeholders. The 98% are the stakeholders. So in a evolved community, it should be bottom-up administration and not top-down administration. It is not that they say so much money is available, so I will distribute depending on what I want. Instead, it is for the community to say what they want, and collectively it goes right up to the top, depending on the amount available it is distributed. It is called equitable distribution, not equal distribution. Depending on the population, depending on the needs, depending on the health condition, whatever it be, on the community. Thank you very much, my brother. So, uh, we have... 40 minutes, madam. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, women first and then I can. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all. فخرج الناس 
كانت اهدافهم محدده في بنغازي ومشاو اخرى سكروا اللي يظنوا ان هيك حرقته ما لفتوش من جنازاتها في خلال 24 ساعه ممكن حتى مش 24 ساعه ست ساعات كان المؤتمر الوطني طلع قانون قرار بغض جميع فكيف يعني كان تاثير المجتمع في صناعه الواقع الامس اقل من 24 ساعه اقل من 24 ساعه ممكن ست ساعات في الصبح وفي الليل لا لا ساعات سو ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذيس فيري فاليوبل كونتريبيوشنز I just would like to make sure that I make certain points because I also have academic objectives people are expecting from me to reach. So two of the major objectives were to explain the shift from hard security to soft and this notion of human security issue. The second was the need for us to evolve in the way we have been perceiving <coughs> the handling of our security. It cannot be the government business only. It has to be everybody's business. And why we are saying that? It's because we believe strongly in the fact that, as Klozovic, Klozovic is a German philosopher, extremely <coughs> famous, who has worked a long time ago on really understanding societies. And Klausowicz, yeah. <laughs> uh, I am not a very good, uh, but Klausowicz, you will see, but it will not be far from this. Klausowicz. Klausowicz. Now, Klausowicz has said that if you work on study societies, you will notice that all societies are composed of the three same elements. All societies. And he said that one is the government, meaning institutions. And the institution, you know them, legislative, executive, and judicial. He said, in all societies, you will find this. A government with the judiciary, the legislative, and the executive. He said, in all societies, you will also find populations. Populations. And he finally said that in all societies, you will find uniform. People. People who wear uniforms. They are policemen, they are gendarmes, they are customs, they are hygiene services, they are all of depending on where you are. But he's right. All societies are composed this way. And that's what close this calls the stool approach. The stool approach. This is a stool on which you can sit. The stool approach. And he said, now, for your stool to be balanced, you need to deal to all these three pillars, all these three legs, the same importance, the same treatment, the same attention. What? meaning has a government when there are no people to lead. You will govern yourself. The government has no meaning if there are no people. The people without a government is an anarchy. Everybody will be a leader and finally you will not have a leader. So you need a government, because the government are those who you have chosen to represent you and do things on your behalf. So government is part of the game. You cannot say, I'm angry with the government, you need to kick them out. No, you need a government in an organized society. And we need uniform people. 
If not, we're going to fight every day on the streets, no police, to come and say, this is the law, why are you doing it? Or another country, Algeria will come to Libya because you don't have uniformed people to defend Libya. So a country without uniformed people cannot function. So all of them are important. You need to pay attention to them. <clears throat> so that's why closely we say you ignore one. The government is here, the stool is in balance. The population, you ignore your people. You do whatever you want. Sooner or later, you will fall down. You don't have an army. Costa Rica has tried it. They're having a difficulty with Panama, trying to take one part of Costa Rica. So you cannot be naive to the point that you say, I don't need uniform. No. Cannot say the world is so uncertain that you need them to deter people to come and take them. So, you don't neglect them, but you also do not give too much importance. If the government is too big, the stool is the power. If people, everything the government is doing, people don't agree, they agree on nothing, the country will be more uh, mobilized. Nothing will happen. If the uniformed people, like in Guinea-Bissau, or in other countries in Egypt, at some point, or Myanmar, where the uniform are controlling everything, the country does not move forward. So, Rosevich said, please have this tool in mind whenever you're dealing with a society. And I like this one. So we said, okay, we accept what Rosevich said. So we need to make sure that all the three components of the society are given the same attention <coughs> and importance. For the stool to remain in equilibrium. But closer to it, further say, it's not only about keeping these three legs at the same length, but it's about also making sure that they all mutualize their efforts for this platform to be strong. A stool is strong when the three legs go to the same direction and will support our society. If you have a government here, uniform, no, the society will, you sit in your break. So whatever is happening in the society, you need these three components to work together for what they share in common to be taken care of in the proper way. Security is not excluded. <coughs> so my, my brother from Tunisia civil society organizations that are part of the population also have a role to play. If you want a society that is strong, sustainable, that can face all these variations of all these calamities, my friend, you need to apply this. These are the major messages I promise to deliver. I hope I deliver them the way I, uh, I want it to. And now, I think that it is for you guys to work a little bit. It's a fun work, and it's also very informative work. We said security has shifted shift it, more human. We need to change the way we are dealing with it. Now everybody is part of it. And Klozovic has said that several centuries ago, let's just go back to his tool. Now, the point is, 
how to do it. Now we know that we need to do this, but how to do it? How can we make sure that civil society organizations, citizens like you, myself, are part of handling the human security issues? I will give this task to my four brothers here who can brainstorm and based on your expertise come up with some recommendation to say that oh civil society can maybe pressure the government to do this civil society can maybe use its expertise in communication skills to communicate with people to understand that they have things to do civil society I, when I teach, when I teach strategy, when I teach citizen engagement in security sector reform or security management, I always challenge my civil society organizations, friends, and say, you make things sometimes a little bit difficult for security people. Why? Whenever our governments accept to invest certain resources to improve security through the security forces. It's very, very, very common to see civil society organizations demonstrating and saying, why are you giving all these resources to the security people for them to guarantee our security. Why? Why you're not doing it in education? Why you're not doing it in this and this and this? They are right for them. But in the meantime, whenever one of them is aggressed by one bandit on the street and they call the police to come and rescue and the police say, we don't have a car. Oh, the only car we have is out of this police station. Oh, we don't have fuel. Or the, the telephone line even does not work. And, and, and the civil society will be the first one to complain. So they want one thing and they want to the These are the things we need to start thinking of. The civil society has interest to maybe supporting security forces for them to guarantee the security for the civil society to continue doing the work is supposed to be, you know, it's kind of leaving this vicious circle and being in a virtuous circle. A circle in which all the elements support each other. Instead of a circle where all the elements are damaging each other. So leaving this vicious circle in which we are most of the time and put ourselves in a virtuous circle. Very easy to say, extremely difficult to do, but this should be our ultimate goal. Yes, my brother. Uh, uh, Mr.
we decided to have women in the military. And the Minister of Defense, who is my boss, told me, Biram, you are the representative of the military in this civil society platform. Can you help us identify civil society organizations working on gender issues? We, we, we are in the military. We were trained to lead men, not women. So even if you want to do it right, maybe we don't have the skills. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, please engage with civil society organizations. Of course. I went and talked to maybe 20 civil organizations that have worked widely on gender issues. And I had a big meeting with them. I said, OK, I want you to go and help the Senegalese military, because now we will receive women, and we don't know how to do it. You have worked for several years on gender issues. Can you come and help us? They were so happy. They were so happy. And we had a one-year program. And we just finished before I left Senegal writing what we call the sectoral strategy on gender we, for the Ministry of Defense. So civil society is helping us. Now we are finished with gender, and we told them the Senegalese military is very well respected and liked in Senegal because they're professional. They have never abused their people. They protect their people. They mingle. They help them. They, they, they're very well liked in Senegal. And we say we want to continue to be liked. But nowadays we know that there are many demonstrations. The young are demonstrating every day. So sometimes the military <coughs> are out and we don't know this type of work. Because generally we were in the barracks. So if we go out and we start mingling with the kids and we Abuse them, maybe it can affect our image. Can you help us work on human rights? Now we are starting a program between the civil society organization and the Senegalese military. For the Senegalese military to do the work they paid for, to do the work the Constitution has given them without violating the Senegalese rights. So these are the collaborations <coughs> we can put in place if we make sure that we work together. So my uh, friends will come up with some recommendations related to what they consider as possible uh, contribution of the average citizen or civil society organization in really tackling this security issue, the human security issue. What can they do? My other friends, <laughs> because another, another aspect of security is that we tend, and this is my last point, we tend to consider our countries as homogeneous entities. And they are not. We tend to, 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 to look at Libya as an entity that is homogeneous. Libya is not homogeneous. Depending on where you are in Libya, in Benghazi or in Tripoli, the population's concerns in terms of security will differ. So security will evolve even within the same country depending where you are. In Guinea, for example, they have very long cost. At the national level, they say, our main priority is the maritime security, because that's what brings most of our resources. They are right to do that. You travel to the interior of Guinea, in a place called the forest of Guinea. When you say, OK, our country has decided to put most of its efforts on maritime security, they will be angry because they have never seen a sea. What matters for them is the forest. So you see, depending on where you are in the same country, the security problems will vary. So you will also help us with recommendations.
to take into consideration this fluctuation of security priorities depending on where you are. We call it the decentralized way of security management. Can we decentralize the way we are dealing with security? We decentralize education. We decentralize health. We decentralize infrastructures. Why could we not decentralize security management to tackle the specificities at the local level? And this best last group will help us talk about how we can finance. Because all these things are very interesting. They're very nice on paper. But if you don't have the resources, it will never happen. What can we find as an innovative approach to mobilize resources? We are all willing to pay a lot of money to send our kids to the best schools for them to get education. We are all willing to send our kids or our uh, husband or our, our wives to the best clinics when they are sick. Are we willing to start contributing to our own security? Are we? It's, we need to debate this. It's, it's, it's at the table. We cannot just keep criticizing the state and the state cannot do everything. Are we willing to contribute at the local level to the improvement of our security when we know that when we are not in security there is nothing we can do at the personal level. We do that for other things. Why don't we do it in the security? Knowing that all the countries we have been counting on to give us security means nowadays they have their own problems. US, France, Italy, all these powers that were used to giving us the means to secure ourselves, they have their own preoccupations. They will not continue to give us what we will ask them. So we need to start thinking of what we can do for ourselves. What can we do for ourselves? That's a very important. My friends, we can stop in 10, 15 minutes. And if you have one or two recommendations, that's fine. OK? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. other people. So it goes in a slow circle, if you see what I mean. So if I teach five people, those people have to teach five other people, each one of them. And that's what's called the multiply effect. And so, by this mean, a lot of people are going to learn about their rights in their countries. Second, we have media campaigning, which we, we studied and heard about um, a lot in the past three days. So by media campaigning, we mean that we should raise awareness via Facebook, Twitter, blogs, and uh, TV, sometimes radio, etc. And then youth campaigning, which is the, the power of every, every revolution, uh, which is encouraging young people to create associations, to raise their voice and express what they truly think about what's going on in their countries. So that's the first point. Again, it's to raise awareness about human rights issues. Yes. My yes. sister, can you please, in one minute, summarize it okay. in Arabic? Yeah. 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 Please.
الاوراق وبالتالي كل شخص من هذه الاشخاص سيختار خمسه اشخاص اخرين سيعلمهم حقوقهم في بلادهم وبالتالي في مده قصيره جدا سيكون عندنا كم كم هائل من الناس الذين تم توعيتهم حول حقوقهم في بلادهم ثاني نقطه هي الميديا كامبينين او استعمال استعمال الحملات الاعلاميه لتوعيه الناس او اليوث كامبينين وهو وهو تشجيع الشباب على تعديل حملات شبابيه يعني سوف يعبرون عن ارائهم تجاه حكومات بلادهم بطريقه حضاريه. My sister, your group has done a wonderful job and please join me in uploading. That's good. That's uh, this time is enough. That's wonderful. You see what civil society can bring. Sensitizing people, training people, raising awareness. That's huge for prevention and for people to understand what they should be. Really, thank you very much, Group One. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
لانه ما فيش يعني هناك صعوبه كذلك بالنسبه فيما يخص الخدمات الاخرى كالتنقل حتى الان حتى الان الشخصي يعني احيانا انا عندي اصدقاء كوليين يتحدثون لي عن احيانا هناك غياب لرجال الشرطه في في المدينه وحطيت باقي الاولويات كبيئه بما انه المدينه ما فيهاش ما فيهاش مصانع يعني البيئه هناك هواء نقي الى غير ذلك هذا فيما يخص مدينتي كازا وكريم جويل تقدمي بيروت اوكي ماي سيستر ذاتس وندرفول Uh -huh. I think everybody now understands that depending on where you are, you are in Tanger, people will care about the maritime and how to cross to go to Europe, illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. You go to El Ayun, Dahla, it's about the desert, where extremely hot, people even don't have enough water, and the war uh, has affected the population there. You know, depending on where you know, you come in Casablanca, it's the economy. So, thank you very much. Please join me in applauding. That's good. Now, last group, last group is the resources. Thank you, my sister. Thank you. Merci. It's a treasure. It's an unstyled love. Huh?
for the local police. You take one year of your time and you say, I want to contribute to improve the police in my locality. So I take one year sabbatical and I work on the voluntary basis. So all these mechanisms will help mobilize not only financial resources, but also human resources. So thank you very much, madam. And uh, it was a pleasure working with you. And I hope all of you will come and visit Senegal one day. Uh, you will be more than welcome. Uh, all together, yes.